Well, I'm delighted to be with you uh, and join you today. And, and Perry Ann, thank you for that very warm and kind welcome. I'm delighted because it's great to be part of this program put on by the Chamber of Digital Commerce. Um, we've come to look to the Chamber to bring real intelligence and clarity to the public discussion of digital assets and blockchain uh, technology. And that intelligence and clarity is so needed. And my thanks to Perry Ann. Uh, Perry Ann, I think, as everybody knows, is truly one of the foundational figures in this emerging field of innovation. And I think someday when we look back, it'll be clear uh, the leadership she's provided. Uh, here, here. And I'm also uh, delighted to follow Craig Phillips, uh, who spearheaded the U.S. Treasury seminal report uh, last year on non-bank financials, fintech, and innovation that he mentioned, which really contains so many important recommendations for streamlining and modernizing the regulatory environment to foster innovation. And I thank Craig for his kind remarks. He, he, by the way, he is the greatest setup man in the world because he introduced about five of the topics I'm going to discuss now. So I really owe him a grat his gratitude. And I'm really delighted to be on the same program as Crypto Mom, uh, my crypto spouse, um, <laughs> Hester Purse. Um, you know, with the crazy schedules that Hester and I keep, we're like two virtual ships passing in the digital night. And I'm sure it's a great comfort to all the crypt our, our crypto kids to see us together in the same place. Um, so it's great to be with you. So uh, as you may know, the potential for the blockchain and its impact on financial markets has been a key focus of ours. I first addressed it in my capacity at the commission three years ago when I called, first called for a do no harm regulatory approach to distribu distributed ledger technology. And since then, the CFTC's Technology Advisory Committee, sponsored by Commissioner Brian Quintens, established a, a subcommittee on DLT and virtual currencies, and you will hear from them at a, at a meeting they're planning in a few weeks' time. And meanwhile, our own lab CFTC, under its great director, Daniel Gorfine, has produced an excellent primer on smart contracts that addresses blockchain and has received really interesting response and, and wide-ranging response from, from the community. And I'm grateful to organizations like the Digital Chamber that have been engaged with us from the beginning along the way. They are a trusted resource, as we see in their thoughtful response to our request for information on crypto markets and mechanics. So today, I look forward to sharing with you my thoughts on technology, regulation, and markets, and the relationship between the three, that digital tri trinity, if you will. Indeed, what makes this era of financial technology innovation so fascinating is the fact that the development of new technologies and business models is intertwined, as so many have spoken about today, with the existence of older regulatory frameworks. Actually, older is not even to do justice. We're talking about 80-year-old regulatory frameworks in the case of the SEC and the CFTC, frameworks that are written originally in the 1930s. And so the challenge is to develop new policy appro approaches upon these venerable regulatory frameworks so that we can keep pace with this rapid pace of innovation. And I suppose that's precisely why we're having this discussion here in Washington, D.C., and cross-pollinating our best and our brightest from many fields and areas of expertise. I'd like to share with you my views on the response of regulators. What's the right response to the challenge of this phase of financial technology? And I believe that there's a number of characteristics of the current period of innovation that specifically, particularly require a new regulatory response. And the first of those may be the most important. It's been often said, but it needs to be said now. We live in a period of exponential technology change. That is, the sheer speed of innovation has increased exponentially, both in terms of production of new models and new products, but also their subsequent public adoption. The production dynamic is driven by increases in the power of computing coupled with decreases in computing costs, which you all know is Moore's Law. But the adoption factor is a function of how the internet and mobile devices allow for rapid public adoption and scalability. And these dynamics put pressure on regulators to keep pace with exponentially changing markets, especially given that the potential for new technologies to impact markets happens so rapidly. 
The second characteristic is the disintermediation of traditional actors or business models. The digitization of virtually everything, from the way we listen to music, the way we travel, the way we gather information, the way we find romance today, means the decentralization of everything. It means the atomization of traditional ecosystems into their smallest component parts, which is especially challenging for traditional approaches to regulation. But if you think about it, what's the traditional approach of regulation? It's to observe a commercial ecosystem and then identify the major infrastructure providers and the major participants and then license them, register them, regulate them, and make them report, and in some cases, in the cases of self-regulatory organizations, make them police ecosystem activity. Yet in a decentralized environment, the challenges are enormous for regulators because too much activity is simply taking place away from these registered and regulated entities. An earlier panelist astutely pointed out that regulators are not accustomed to dealing with digital anonymous citizens in our ecosystems. And that's exactly what we have in this new world. And it's why regulators struggle with commercial outsourcing. It's why regulators struggle with data cloud migration and with fast innovation and with non-traditional innovation. And it's why market regulators, especially central banks, struggle with cryptocurrencies that all, uh, offer alternative means and rails to execute payment transactions and drive capital raising activity. Whenever innovation circumvents traditional financial markets or actors or centralizers, then traditional regulatory frameworks struggle to apply and it's a formidable regulatory challenge. Finally, the third reason why I believe this phase of technological evolution is unique is simply the scarcity of technological literacy. The pace and nature of technology-driven innovation requires a high degree of technological literacy that is in short supply. There's simply not a sufficient amount of adequate technological literacy at hand for regulators to draw on. Those talented professionals who have cutting-edge skills are paid far more in the private sector. And those who are available to work in the public sector do not necessarily have those cutting edge skills. All right, so given these characteristics, how is a regulator to respond and keep pace with rapidly changing markets? Well, I believe that the response must have four key elements, elements that we've tried to draw upon at the CFTC. And those elements are, one, adopting an exponential growth mindset. And I'll talk about that in a second. The second one is creating an internal fintech stakeholder, which we've done with Lab CFTC. Third is becoming what I call a quantitative regulator. And fourth is embracing market-based solutions. So let me drill down into those, starting with adopting an exponential growth mindset. I said before that we're in this period of exponential growth in technological change. And I believe that we have no cha chance, sorry, we have no chance of keeping pace unless we one anticipate that almost everything around us is going through an exponential pace of change. And second, that market participants will adopt innovation at that same exponential rate of change. They will, there's no alternative. And so that means that the demands of regulators by innovators, the demands they will place upon us will also grow exponentially. And that leaves us no choice but to maximize our regulatory capability to meet that exponential demand. And that's why at the CFTC we believe throughout our organization we must have that exponential growth mindset. We must anticipate the change that's all around us and we must anticipate finding ways to respond to it. The second point is that we believe that we must have an internal FinTech stakeholder and that's what we've done with Lab CFTC. It's our focal point to promote responsible FinTech innovation and engage with the FinTech community. You, you may be familiar with it. It was launched two years ago, and in that time, it's had over 250 separate interactions with innovators big and small. We've placed its offices in New York City, not in Washington. 
and it conducts lab hours in places where innovators work, from Silicon Valley, California, to Silicon Hills, Texas, from the South Bank of London to Singapore Central. Now, Lab CFTC is not a sandbox. It does not try to pick winners from losers, nor does it exempt firms from our rules. Instead, what Lab CFTC does is give us both an internal and an external technology focus. Externally, that means reaching out and learning about technological change and market evolution, while provided a dedicated liaison to innovators. And then internally, it means explaining that technology to agency staff within our agency and regulators outside of our agency and advocating for technological adoption. Lab CFTC also serves to manage and resolve this ever-present and growing tension between innovation and those old legacy regulations. And I'm proud to say that I believe Lab CFTC has become a category leader. Every US financial uh, regulator has either created or is, or is creating a program similar to Lab CFTC. And a lot of that is a testimony to the personnel that have manned Lab CFTC under, under Daniel Gorefine's leadership. The third ingredient is transitioning our agency to become what I call a quantitative regulator. And what do I mean by quantitative regulation or quant reg? Well, look what's going on in the private sector in our markets. We see commercial trade execution and strategy in regulated markets increasingly driven by quantitative market data analysis using sophisticated AI and machine learning capabilities. That means, once again, we have no choice but to proceed in the same direction and become a highly sophisticated quantitative data regulator. It means utilizing effective and up-to-date big data analysis capability based upon robust data collection, automated data analysis, and artificial intelligence capability. It will provide us with accurate market intelligence and effective trade surveillance and oversight, elements that are essential for generating well-calibrated policy prescriptions and more effective, more capable regulation. I spoke earlier about how digitization leads to systemic decentralization. And I believe that quantitative regulation allows regulators to be effective without the traditional reliance on registering, regulating, and co-opting all major market participants. Rather, it empowers regulators to conduct themselves independent market data analysis. It makes regulators less reliant on delegation of duties to self-regulatory organization and organizations and information received from major market participants. This potential becomes all the more powerful in the not too distant future when regulators can occupy nodes in financial blockchains. Finally, the fourth and last ingredient in our mixture is embracing market-based solutions. And I start with the point that markets are in our regulatory DNA. They're the basis for our regulatory mandate. Free markets are adept at valuing innovation and managing enterprise risk. They support unparalleled industrial and technological innovation. And through the interaction of hundreds, if not thousands, of individual economic actors, markets further derive price and value discovery and allow for the efficient allocation of resources and permit risk transfer that drives stability and certainty in real world economic activity. Many of you in this room today understand these dynamics given the development, albeit it's sometimes uneven, of modern crypto markets and their many facets. And it's true, markets are not always perfect. They have proven time and again, however, to be the most effective means humans have to drive economic activity and prosperity. You can think of free capital markets as the ultimate in crowdsourced and decentralized decision making. And we at the CFTC believe in the power of markets to best determine the value of technology-driven innovation. And I know Paul Atkins talked a little bit this morning, and Craig Phillips mentioned it earlier, about the experience we had with Bitcoin futures. But I do want to take a minute and just talk about it because of its important role in helping find the value, the true value of innovation. 
At the end of 2017, two CFTC exchanges self-certified and listed futures products based upon the value of Bitcoin. And at the time, some questioned the decision to allow them to self-certify. Yet we believe that risk transfer markets comprised of sophisticated institutional investors are the best mechanism to determine and were the best me mechanism to determine the value of Bitcoin. And I think a strong case can be made that the results this past year have confirmed that view. At the time of launch of Bitcoin, in fact, the day of launch, Bitcoin futures, had, the price had exceeded $19,000 of Bitcoin. And many observed a bubble condition. And yet within months of the product launch, that value was repriced back below $10,000. Some have speculated that this price decrease reflected a reversion to Bitcoin fundamentals, namely correlation to the cost of production. And in fact, economists from the San Francisco Fed noted in a 2018 paper that the launch of Bitcoin futures products coincided with the subsequent and precipitous drop in the price of Bitcoin, perhaps because the futures allowed for the first time an accessible way to speculate against the price that the market had established in the cash market. The decrease in price may have been helped, and it may have helped end a speculative bubble, and it may have allowed this novel technology and asset class a quieter time to continue to develop from a technological and adoption sense. But the key takeaway, however, is that free markets work, and they work especially well at price and value discovery. And the expression of a market is, after all, the right forum for such information discovery rather than the mere opinion or perspective of a few. So there you have it, the CFTC approach for keeping pace with fintech innovation, including blockchain, adopting an exponential growth mindset at the regulatory agency, creating an internal fintech stakeholder, becoming a quantitative regulator, and embracing market-based solutions. So that's our regulatory approach. And as I close, let me ask you, what should be the approach of regulators? Well, here's my advice. Keep going. Solve real problems. Innovate boldly with integrity and intelligence. Get competent advice and follow the law. But be strong, be brave, be bold. And don't be afraid. Keep going. Work with us. Talk to us. Interact with us through Lab CFTC and our regulatory divisions. It's true that our regulations were designed in an era that's long gone, and our markets have been transformed by time and by technology. Yet the principles underlying our regulations <laughs> remain relevant, and they remain enforceable. So visit with us, make us smarter, engage with us on this journey that we're on together, pursue new roads with this ever dynamic and quickening evolution that we're seeing in free markets, markets that will continue to serve as a forum for human expression, human aspiration, and human creativity for us and for generations to come. Thank you all very much.